Oh, okay, let me give you another minute. Now you're going to ruin my video production. Is that the way for you? All right. Alright. Quizlet, not exam, Quizlet. Alright. Not to say, uh, not to say topic, yeah. What? No, more quizzes. Last assignment. Alright. Right, Sam's ready, so I think we're all ready. Has what? Oh, really? Alright. So the last thing we're going to talk about is competitive exposure before I do a little wrap up, uh, talk about key takeaways. So the basic idea of competitive exposure, uh, let me just jump to this slide, is you, is you can think of, of three ways to think about our exposure to a foreign currency. Translation, transaction, and competitive. Translation, that's the first one we talked about. That is simply an accounting nerd's exposure. In other words, it's not a cash flow exposure. Like, I don't care about cash flow, my, or I only care about cash flow. However, if you may have to report gains or losses in the income statement if the exchange rate changes, and that depends on the translation method, which then depends on whether your functional currency is the dollar or another currency. So translation gains or losses are just paper gains and losses they may not actually be cash flow gains or losses. Transaction exposure is your exposure to actual cash. In other words, I have a receivable in euro. When it actually comes due, the euro devalued and I got less dollars. That, that hurts. All right, that's an actual transaction loss. Now the last one is actually the most important one. And that's competitive exposure. And simply all it is, it's future transaction gains and losses. But here's the trick, right? You may only have receivables and payables that go out six months, right? But as a firm, you're gonna be out there for hopefully decades. So what about the customers that haven't signed up yet and the suppliers you haven't signed a contract on yet? What about the exposure to a currency for all the future business? And that's what competitive exposure is about. And competitive exposure is really about your viability of your firm. It's not whether you take a 10% hit on your receivables or payables because of the exchange rate change. It's really about the viability of your firm. So this is this last topic, this competitive exposure. So again, short, you can think about transaction exposure as short run. It's short run gains and losses, cash flow gains and losses. And in the short run, you can't change your prices, you can't move production, and competitors can't move production or change prices. Right? It's the, you know, as if we've all kind of set out a catalog and committed those prices. The competitive exposure is long run. So in the long run, you have the ability to change prices. Your competitors have the ability to change prices. And you and your competitors have the ability to move production somewhere else. Right? So this is the topic of competitive exposure. So here's a stupid example I made up. All right. Well, silly. You have a firm, PA Widget. You produce widgets in Pennsylvania that cost $100 to produce in Pennsylvania. You sell them to Germans at 84 euros. Say the spot price of the euro is buck twenty-five per euro. Therefore, when you take your 84 euros at buck twenty-five, looks like you get $105 for your sale and you wind up with a $5 profit. Nice little business model, right? Make widgets for $100 in Pennsylvania and sell them for $105 in Germany. However, your business has a problem. You commit it to selling a, a widget at 84 euros to a German, but by the time they, pulled, they, they paid you, the euro devalues by, nine, by, by 10%. In no other words, the euro goes from 125 to 112 a 10% reduction in the euro, nominal devaluation of the euro. So, you still pay $100 to produce the widget. You quote at the German 84 euros, can't change that. However, when it comes due, you only get a buck 12. So you now have a transaction loss of $5 on the widget. 
All right, by the way, if we're doing our fun little math, all right, old minus new over new exchange rate, that actually was 11% appreciation of the dollar, 10% devaluation of the euro, just for fun. All right, everyone got, yes? Oh, just that the exchange rate was 125 and it, and the, and it fell by 10%, I just took 90% of its value. Yes, yeah, so I just took 10% off. All right. So this is a transaction loss, right? You're expecting uh, 125 and you got 112. Let's talk about this a minute. So how do we get better? So we just took a loss. Well, that sucks. So what are we going to do about in the future? Well, in the future, how can we get back to a $5 profit in the future? Well, we could lower our costs to 89.5 and we get that bad exchange rate and we're better. Well, that's a dumb answer. Why didn't you lower your cost before if you can lower your cost now, right? Well, that's, that's, that's stupid. Chris, you should never let me say that. <laughs> Next one, why don't we just raise our prices? Raise our prices, and I just got a number here that made it so we got back to, to $5, and that turns out by raising the prices by 11%. If I raise my prices to 11%, I'll get back to my $5 profit. Is that stupid too? It is not stupid. That is not stupid, Chris. Stop picking on me. You should exactly be able to raise prices by 11% and the Germans will never know. Because, here's the flashback back to purchasing power parity. Here's, remember this little equation? The new exchange rate. Oh, I don't like when that happens. The new exchange rate equals the old exchange rate times one plus inflation over one plus inflation. Remember that one? So if the exchange rate was moving according to PPP, purchasing power parity, so the new exchange rate is 112, the old exchange rate was 125. Let's just pretend there is no inflation in the US. That's what that zero is, zero inflation in the US. Let's solve this equation for this. In other words, what inflation in the Eurozone would have caused a decrease in the exchange rate from 125 to 112? You okay with that? It's 11.11% inflation. You see what I just did there? Why would the exchange rate go from 125 to 112 if there was zero inflation in the US? Well, it must have been 11% inflation in the Eurozone. So, in the Eurozone, if I assume that all prices in the Eurozone are up 11%, I just raise my widget price by 11% and no one notices. Because the German widget prices, they all went up 11%, so you just raise your price. I shouldn't say no one notices, but the relative prices are the same. PA widget and Dufeldorf for whatever widget, <laughs> both went up 11%, and so you didn't lose any sales due to Relative price changes. <laughs> you could, but I'm thinking of you know a widget sitting in the you know in a shop in Germany, and you're the only good that sells in dollars. Uh, that's kind of odd, right? Yeah. This is assuming you have not you you see this happening, so this is future sales. We already lost the five. Yeah, this this is gone. This is gone. It's the catalog price or the internet price you have listed. The next one, you're good. And this is the the weird the weird part about we spent so much time talking about transaction exposure. Transaction exposure is almost meaningless. It's it's insignificant. If you had the ability to change prices, yeah, we lost one on that last widget. All right, but we're not in 1980. We don't publish a catalog anymore. We just have internet prices, right? You can change them overnight. So you just notice the exchange rate changed. You notice it was caused by inflation. So you just raise your prices. Yeah, you lost five bucks on that last widget. The next million widgets, you're good. So what I'm gonna to propose to you is the firm is at no disadvantage due to this appreciation of the dollar devaluation of the euro. They just lost a little money on that last widget. So, for example, I, have, I was in Mexico when the dollar started appreciating, and it wasn't as easy a decision because, for example, you could be at a specific price point. 
in the in euros, like it could be 10 euros, or so you're gonna break a price point, you're at risk of people switching from this widget to something else, stop buying widgets at all, right? That could be one option. Uh, another option is that the price elasticity from, for your product is really high. So there's a lot of things that you need to consider. True. Your competition might not raise prices. So here, but the assumption here is all prices in Europe went up by 11%. Exactly. Widgets, labor, everything. What's tricky, so this is kind of a good point, what's tricky is there's inflation all over Europe by 11%, except for the widget industry, which decided to hold line on prices. Then you're a little screwed. So it's a little more complicated, yeah. Would this be more of a consumer situation a lot of the time? Because like with what I do with letters of credit, everything that's in Walmart or Target and all those things is backed and paid for by a letter of credit. So the price and everything is set, and the banks and the other companies, other companies no not necessarily but what, what you're saying is you're kind of locked into prices for a year ahead of time so so bottom line actually you, we just eliminate all our risk you know let's go back to last last topic we actually didn't even probably recognize this because we entered into a forward contract at uh, at 125 so we actually got rid of that risk and on the future ones next year, you're just ready to change prices. So actually, hopefully, you took no losses. You locked down that first one with a forward, and the second one, you're just ready to change prices, unless you're in this weird situation that, yeah, overall, inflation's 11%, but the widget industry decided to hold line on prices, then you are in trouble. We'll talk more about that. All right, we good? So... This little discussion should be a little disturbing in that um, I've been lying to you for the last four weekends in that what I've been telling you are things like, hey, if the dollar uh, devalues by 10%, U.S. goods are 10% cheaper to the rest of the world, right? And I said, if the Chinese yuan appreciates 10%, you know, the cost of outsourcing increases 10%, all right? I kind of gave you that simple world and that simple world is where goods prices aren't changing. The only thing changing are exchange rates. All right. Well, that's that's a, a real simple world, but you weren't hand, you weren't ready for the truth yet. You weren't handled. <laughs> so the real truth is, well, we can't really tell what happened to import prices just by looking at exchange rates. We have to look at change in prices and the exchange rate, put them both together, and then talk about whether the good prices are cheaper or not. Right. So for the PA widget example, I can't tell you, just because the euro devalued 11%, I can't say, and the, I'm sorry, the dollar is up 11% and the euro is down 11, uh, 10%. I can't tell you whether anyone's at an advantage or disadvantage. I first have to see what happened to overall prices. And that's in the long run, price, we just say by definition, the long run is defined by the ability to change prices in production. So... This leads to our last big idea of the semester, and that is everything we've been doing has been called a nom we've been focusing on nominal changes in the exchange rate. In other words, changes in the state at rate you see on the internet, right? The nominal changes, the state at rates, we just exchange rate went from a dollar ten to a dollar five. That's roughly a five percent devaluation. That matters for transaction gains or losses that you've not or tran transaction exposures which you've not hedged with a forward contract. That matters. But in the long run, what we're really going to care about is something called the real appreciation of a currency. And the real appreciation of a currency is the nominal change adjusted for inflation. So it's two things moving, not one. So in this last example, what I'll show you is Yes, there was a nominal devaluation of the euro by 10%. But what I'll show you is there was no real change in the euro. There was no real devaluation of the euro. Therefore, everyone's okay. Just change your prices. Now, calculating the real appreciation, that's a little tricky because you have two moving parts. And here's how you do it. Oh my God, you knew there was an equation coming up, didn't you? So here's how you calculate a real appreciation of a currency. Two-step process. First step, calculate 
the new real, so you have an exchange rate at one from X to Y, right? Old rate to new rate. Step one, actually calculate the real exchange rate. The real exchange rate at time T for currency H over F, whatever H over F is, equals the new rate you actually observed, that's the nominal rate you actually observed, times one over I over one over I. Why does that equation look funky relative to every other equation I gave you that looks like that? What looks weird about that? Yeah. This is say dollar over euro, dollar over euro, euro over dollar. I flipped them. And every other place I always said always be consistent. All right? If it's dollar over euro, make sure it's dollar over euro. Ever. So why is this different? Because we're actually reversing out the effects of inflation. So we're taking, say, the new exchange rate, which is in quote it in, say, dollar per euro, but then multiplying euro over dollar inflation rates. So we're almost kind of doing the inverse of forecasting an exchange rate. We're actually looking at the ex post inflation, what happened, and actually going backwards. And that's called the real exchange rate. We then get that real exchange rate and just plug it in my new minus old over old equation, my percent change, and that'll give you the real appreciation of the currency. So let's just do that for uh, PA widget and the Eurozone. The new stated exchange rate was $1.12, right? Is that what I said it went to? Went from $1.25 to $1.12. That's the new nominal exchange rate, and that's quoted as dollar over euro. However, I said euro inflation was 11%, dollar inflation was 0%. So the real exchange rate at time t is $1.25. The old exchange rate was $1.25. Therefore, there's no real appreciation. Your firm will be fine. Just change your prices. Another way of stating this without doing math in some cases is if the exchange rate simply goes up, bless you, simply goes up due to inflation, as the PPP model predicts, there never will be a real change in the exchange rate. All right. Remember I said this class would be easier if there weren't indirect exchange rates? Well, what do you do if it's an indirect exchange rate? It's, it's always something, yeah, it's always, it's always something. It always makes sense when I do direct quotes. When I do indirect quotes, it's a little different. So here's just a silly example, not a silly, why do I say that? A simple example, uh, actually from 1980 to 1995, the yen, one from 226 to 94. Is that an appreciation or depreciation of the yen? It's an appreciation of the yen, depreciation of the dollar. So the yen went from 226 to 94 in 15 years. During that same period, inflation in the US was 85%. Inflation in Japan was 31% over that entire period of time. Not, annual, not annualized. So the question is, what was the real appreciation of the yen? Well, I'm going to use my two-step process. The new exchange rate is 94. That's yen per dollar. So I'm going to uh, multiply times one plus dollar over yen inflation rates. And I get a real exchange rate of 132. I then say the new real exchange rate minus the old rate over the old rate is minus 41%. When I do new minus old over old, that tells me about the base or quote currency, that denominator current, I'm sorry, the base or denominator currency. That told me that the dollar is down 41%. The dollar nominally or had a real devaluation of 40%. However, the yen, how would I get the yen's real appreciation? Old minus new real over new real. The yen appreciated 70% in 15 years. Real appreciation. 
which means in theory, Toyotas would have been 70% more expensive in a 15 year period. I'm sorry, what did I say? I said, and I say, what did I, who did I say? I said yen, right? Oh, okay. Or did I say yuan? All right. So, so why is Japan in a two, three decade period recession or stagnation? Well, not stagnation, just kind of slow economic growth. Part of this is this real appreciation of the yen, which they haven't fully recovered from. They've had to cut prices to compete because their currencies appreciate it in real terms. Just for fun, I gave you a third one. You're, I know, you're welcome. Yeah, seriously. All right. So the Aussie dollar goes from 90 cents to 99 cents. All right. Without a calculator, what was the appreciation of the Aussie? That's good. 10% appreciation of the Aussie, right? There's a direct quote currency. It went from 90 cents to 99 cents. That's a 10% appreciation of the Aussie. However, over that period, inflation was 5% in U.S., 10% in Aussie land. So what was the real appreciation of the Aussie? So if you're actually doing business with the Australians, what actually happened? Well, I could do my manual calculation, the real exchange rate taking the new nominal rate times the ratio of inflations, 99 cents over Aussie over US inflation. The real rate went to 103. Plug that into my new real minus old over old. I got a 15% real appreciation of the Aussie. You okay? So what's going on is what that means is that Australian goods are now 15% more expensive to Americans. That is actually the point of calculating real appreciation is to answer that question. How much more expensive are Australian goods to Americans? They're 15% more expensive. Why? Because the currency is 10% more expensive and their prices are 5% more expensive. Right? Their, our prices went up by 5, their prices went up by 10. So if the exchange rate was constant, their prices are 5% more expensive. But layer on top of that, their currency is 10% more expensive. Therefore, their goods are 15% more expensive. So if you're in an international business with your firm and you're looking at countries with exchange rates varying, you need to keep track of both parts, inflation and the exchange rate to see if it actually has an effect on your business. Brian. So I think it was going back to our first weekend together using the example of changes in the value of the euro and when you would take your trip to Paris. Yes. So would you have to do this to really understand it? Like how much more time? Right, so a really good question. Most of the well-functioning developed economies all have inflation to zero. Right? Europe, Scandinavia, Japan, US, <coughs> Canada, we all have inflation next to zero in Australia. Therefore, at almost any change in those exchange rates among the top low inflation nations are all real changes in the exchange rate. Where you're going to find differences between nominal change and real change for a country that's high inflation relative to the US. So, for example, Zimbabwe. Right? If they're running 100% inflation per year, right? the currency is devaluing. Offset, but that's where you have to type in real exchange rate. However, every day the euro changes, it's pro it's most likely a real change. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, a real change because it wasn't driven by inflation. So it's a good point. We're probably worrying more about real on countries with much different inflation. It could be China because China sometimes they have thousands of products with the same inflation. Yeah. It's like a timing thing because. I guess we'd say, well, there's more than, more than just the inflation factor. I am glad you asked that. Why would a currency have a real appreciation? So I think what the first bullet should have said or might say is as long as the exchange rate is just floating toward, uh, according to inflation rates, there never would ever be 
a real change. Oh, you don't have 5% inflation, high inflation, oh, their currency just devalued by 5%, no real change. Oh, Mexico just had 10% higher inflation than the US, oh, their currency just devalued by 10%, no real change. Right? If that was the world, if the world was according to PPP, you'd never have a real change. So the question is, when would you have a real change? Anytime there's a change in the exchange rate not driven by inflation, which is the Greeks just announced that they've been lying on their budget deficits for the last 10 years. Therefore, there's less faith in the Eurozone staying together. Therefore, the Euro just devalued by 10% today. That was a real devaluation. Or the day after the tsunami in Japan, in Japan the exchange rate had a big change over the next month. It was a 10% change. That was a real change. So anything that's not driven by inflation is going to cause a real change. By the way, the Japan one, the tsunami one was fascinating. What would you expect to happen to the, the, real, the real nominal value of the uh, yen right the day after the tsunami? Expect this to take a dive, right? It actually wound up depreciating 20% within a month. Okay. Uh, you all, you all, futures and options. Right. So the, uh, the Japanese case was fast enough, so I was watching it, so I was expecting the next morning for the currency to just kind of fall. And it starts strengthening, and it strengthens at 20, almost uh, over 20% of the, in the month. Uh, I finally found a story that kind of matches it. I, don't know if I, I think it's true. Because in theory, you'd think it would cause a weaker economy, right? And maybe even more budget deficits if the government tries to repair all the things. You think the currency would devalue because there's less demand for, uh, for, their, for their investments and things? But the, was it almost it was so bad that, that there were such dire predictions of what would happen to the economy? Because this is right before we didn't know there was going to be a meltdown and you know all this uh, Chernobyl type of thing. Actually, what happens, all these Japanese firms <coughs> and investors that have money all over the world they start bringing it back home because they thought things could get desperate over there. And just the movement of yen from America to Japan, as, as firms got worried about maybe I need to start hoarding cash, caused the yen to appreciate. They're just all just bringing the money back home because they're worried about the future. So I thought that was kind of an interesting case where my initial thought, I thought we'd also be massively back, they're gonna get slaughtered. It actually started going the other way because all of the Japanese nationals and firms bringing money back home because they're worried about the future. Did that affect the US dollar? Absolutely, yeah. It caused a weakening of the US dollar as that's one of our major trading partners and a lot of Japanese have their money both in Europe and US. Yeah. Yeah. I had a different additional thought on that was that they were so their culture, they're so confident and maybe they were wise and see this not to be as good as you know they invest. Well, yeah, I guess that could be true. Yeah, I, don't, I never thought about the motivation. Uh, uh, although I'll say that I, I heard the biggest cash flow was the Japanese insurance companies, though, because they're literally just bringing money back home so they realize they have to pay claims. Uh, so the biggest cash flow driver was insurance companies, but you're right, it could be the opposite. Of, you know, I think everyone's going to be underestimating us. This might be a time to build or expand. So, so what about... I guess it's to the extent that the U.S. insurance companies have money abroad that they think they need to bring it back to the states. All right. I, and I don't know if we're at the scale. You know, is the are the companies invested overseas, and is are the events such that they have to start bringing money back? You know, they don't have enough sort you know cash in the U.S. So yeah. But I think the tsunami was such, uh, and, the, and the meltdown of the plants were such a big effect that I, you know, I think that money will start flowing in. I don't know if that's the U.S. case. Yes. All right. Now, this is the really hard thing, and uh, I was going to give you a case that's going to be doing two weeks on this. Okay. But 
The case is actually about this long term exposure. Like, how do we actually, how do we actually think about how to identify, measure, and mitigate our competitive exposures? So, how does PA Widget do our INN, identify, measure, and mitigate for competitive exposure? All right, so what are they exposed to? Well, they're exposed to a devalu, you know, a long-term real devaluation of the euro or real appreciation of the dollar. That's what their long-term exposure is to. All right, they export to the euro. So one way of thinking about it is they're exposed to a real, real appreciation of the dollar, that makes their goods more expensive, or a real deal that devaluation of the euro. It's a flip side of saying it's the same way of saying, saying they're exposed to a devaluation of the euro. So the question is, well, how could I how can I actually get a measurement of it? And the case is a really painful case looking at uh, GM's exposure to the yen. I'm trying to figure out, well, how can GM measure its exposure to a massive devaluation of the yen? And they were worried about this in the early 2000s. They are worried about a massive devaluation of the yen. Right. Now, to do it, it requires a lot of effort and a lot of assumptions. You have to assume, well, what is the change in the exchange rate? What would I do? What would I do to change the prices? Uh, it's difficult. And then once you even get that number, well, what do you do about it? Okay, we could lose a billion dollars if the yen devalues 10% in real terms because the Japanese cars will get cheaper. What do you do about it? Well, I build cars in Japan. By Japanese automakers, they did, they did part of that. They own own states and a bunch of Japanese automakers. Uh, we just make this case extra credit. Well, I you know, think so. Maybe if like you know, you do, they can be some sketchy points. Talk about that. Yeah. 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 Listen, chew on that. So the, the case is difficult. I'll, I'll give you the bottom line, what happened in that case. So, so GM <coughs> measured that they could lose billions of dollars if the yen devalued and the Japanese got a cost advantage on the Americans. They did buy stakes into far, they did buy a bunch of uh, stakes into uh, a bunch of the smaller Japanese automakers. Basically, you know, can't beat them, just buy them. So you, you're partially American and you're partially Japanese. They did consider, well, do we put some production facilities in Japan? Or maybe let's, uh, let's bill our transmissions in Japan, so put some of our costs in Japanese yen. Uh, they didn't do that. What they decided to do, pretty ingenious. Well, why build a billion dollar plant in Japan just to get cost in Japan? Why don't we just, we need some money this year, why don't we just get a billion dollar yen denominated bond? Next time we need money. That's what they did. So in spend, instead of spending a decade to build a billion dollar plant in Japan to get some of your costs in yen, they make a phone call and within an hour they got a billion dollar loan payable in Japanese yen. And they basically moved their cost structure to yen. All right. For in, this, in the case, they talk about Argentina as well, right? Crazy what do you do then? Like what, what does companies have done in those cases? So in that case, the kind of second minor one was the, <laughs> the GM sells cars in Argentina, but they don't produce cars in Argentina. So Argentine, Argentinian revenues, but no costs, are exposed to devaluation of the Argentine currency, right? That was the case. Um, first thing they did, uh, 
the first thing we do is uh, that we're actually sitting on a bunch of uh, uh, queso, right? We're sitting on a bunch of queso. We, the first thing we do is we get rid of all the cash. Don't sit on the currency. Right? You need revenues in queso. Why are you sitting on cash? Uh, and then, we, uh, I mean, that's a, then it's just a matter of entering into forward contracts. So you can just enter into forward contracts to lock in the exchange rate. So that's, that's it. Is it the same to, like, the effect is the same if either you go to forward contracts or you get a, a loan? Is it a similar effect? Like, you get that huge loan? Then yeah, happens. yeah. So we kind of talked about a little bit this yesterday. Is one other way to kind of if you don't want to use a forward contract to hedge the exposure. You know, say they they expect to get an Argentinian peso revenue next year. You could enter into a forward contract uh, to sell them. Uh, the other thing you can do is get a peso loan that's roughly equal to the amount of revenue you're going to get next year. So you get the peso loan and then you pay it off next year just when the revenue is coming in. It kind of works the same way as a forward. Um, but I, actually, there is a big takeaway from that case I'll mention because it's, it actually is important. And uh, one of the takeaways of actually the peso part of that case was at the time they want to try to hedge the peso. All right, and what's going on in Argentina at the time is there, the government is about to collapse uh, economically running huge budget deficits and they're about to default on all their bonds. So everyone kind of knows there's about a 50% chance of them going into default in the next six months. The problem with that situation is, say the spot price is say four pesos per dollar. The one year forward <coughs> was two pesos. It's eight pesos per dollar. So that when they went to the forward market, it was already valuing the massive devaluation of the peso. So all they could do is lock into it. So uh, the only bad part about not getting to that case, that will be the takeaway now, is you can't use forward contracts to head against an enemy at risk. If everyone knows the peso is about to the Argentine government is about to go bankrupt and fall on other bonds. The forward rate will already reflect that, that possibility. So all you can do is kind of lock into that loss, which then argues that you should be hedging long term before the anticipated changes. So I guess one of the truisms we didn't get to do instead of do this case is you can't hedge a risk with everyone. Those going to happen. Why would, a, why would a bank give you an exchange rate of four per four per four to one a year from now when everyone knows it's going to be eight to one a year from now? The forward price will be eight to one. All you'll get to do is lock into that eight to one, then you'll know you're locked in that value. All right. How do we hedge this long-term competitive exposure? Well, <clears throat> number one is just price exposure. Just be ready to change prices. Pull the trigger and change prices as soon as you see, as you see inflation-driven exchange rate. Have price adjustment clauses that maybe tied to real changes or inflation. Relative to, uh, to kind of the Japanese story is maybe have a, the only way you can be able to change prices is not to have a commodity, so maybe you need to build a bit of a brand or a niche market that has some pricing power. Be ready to throw, to delete your, uh, you know, your nidget, your, your widget uh, goods and maybe you offer the super widget. You know, maybe you need to move production to Germany or Japan or China. So it's anticipating what could happen and being ready to make changes. Number one, another one is just head, just uh, finance any foreign operations with foreign denominated debt, just like I said with the GM case. Uh, HR contracts, you know, maybe if you have salespeople or someone with P&L responsibility in dollars, you should 
not be compensating them for something they can't control, and also not firing them for something they can't control. They should have contracts that have you know, clauses that look at the real change in the exchange rate, and we're gonna forgive you if there's a real you know, appreciation of the dollar and you couldn't sell to the Germans. That's not your fault. Right, we need to recognize what's going on. Uh, accounting strategy, why compound problems? Just make the foreign currency the, the, the functional currency. You can get rid of the uh, translation gains or losses. And then lastly, you could head to a long dated options or forward contracts if you want it. Um, this last three slides just for fun. So what's going on with China relative to this? China didn't allow the currency to appreciate for years. So it was this built up inertia for the currency to appreciate as soon as they let go. Eventually they let go of it. Largely free floating now, which is sometimes they get an intervention. What happens is now is their currency has appreciated. At the same time, it had higher inflation, in particular wage inflation. So, anyone uh, deal with Chinese outsourcing? And so, in the last class, there was a last year's class, there was three or four people directly involved in outsourcing. China. And what they're telling me is five five to twenty percent wage increases a year. In Yuan, like the Yuan paychecks are going up ten to twenty percent a year. And the currency is appreciating five to ten percent a year. So the Chinese labor is going up twenty to thirty percent a year. So that's why these Chinese cities are no longer the cheapest in Asia anymore. Everyone's trying to find the next China. They can tell me there's just a scarcity of relatively skilled laborers at those production hubs, and those workers will move in a second to get that next year if you want. Uh, just flip, just jump in firm, and firm, and firm, and firm. And firm. So this is the real value of the yuan since 1994 to 2016, it has doubled. So China is no longer the cheap place to produce goods. Last two slides. So what is Japan's lesson for China? I kind of mentioned this two, a month ago. When I was your age, I was younger than that, when I was an undergrad, Japan was China. Calculator was made in Japan. Television was made in Japan. Clothing were made was made in Japan. Right? And the big political fallout was the U.S. was being taken advantage by these low-wage, exploited Japanese workers. <laughs> That's the mod. Because now Japan is one of the highest uh, cost of production places in the world. Yeah, yeah. So they had essentially it's called the last the lost decade, right? Of traditional lost two decades now. Yeah, really come out of it. Do you foresee that happening? Yeah, they've had China twenty China. years of really almost no economic <laughs> growth. Uh, some people say, well, it, it has to it has to somewhat to do with the real appreciation of their currency and the increased wages. Uh, you know, some might argue that the economy's not free enough, there's too much of control by the government and kind of collusion among the firms, and, uh, but yeah, I think it's somewhat caused by this real appreciation of the currency. And the only good thing is by the time they got to this lost two decades now, they're now also probably one of the richest countries in the world, so if you're gonna get into a, if you're gonna get into a rut, you might as well get to the top first. All right, so okay to get in a rut when you're the richest country in the world and have the highest wages in the world, one of the best living standards in the world. China's still down here. Right, there's still you know, a third of the U.S. wage, a quarter of the U.S. wages, and, and uh, GDP per capita. So what are the lessons that Japan has in China? Well, one thing, China's really smart. They think long term. They, they, they know Japan is their model of the future. And what did Japan do initially to, to try to solve this problem? They did the same thing China did. 
The second biggest holder of U.S. dollars and treasuries is Japan. It was only surpassed by China two years ago. Because initially, Japan resisted and started hoarding dollars and printing, printing yuan to keep the yen down. At some point, it was unsustainable. They can't, they can't own any more U.S. dollars, and they kind of gave up. And they got out of the currency business. And also, the currency got so big, you can't control it anymore. So Japan did what China did initially, and then they gave up. And then how did Japan survive? <coughs> well, they had, they had to create niche products. They can't compete on price anymore. When you can't compete on price, you can create niche products. All right? Japan doesn't make money on condo courts in America. All right? They gotta sell Lexus and Infinity and Lexus Infinity and what? Acura. Right? And that's their answer, is we can't compete on price, we have to compete on product quality and get a premium. And that's what they had to do. They couldn't just make no-name TVs and slap an American name on it, they had to come up with Sony brands. So the next step for China is they need to have a Sony of China. A Toyota, an Acura of China, because they can't compete on price anymore. What else did the Japanese do? They moved to America. Japanese car makers come to South Carolina to exploit the cheap South Carolinian labor. <laughs> right. Our uh, right to work states in the South are, is, is Japan's third world production facility. That's why they go there. It's low wages and, 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 and difficult to form unions. That's why they're there. Yeah. So, did it take a long time for people's perception of China, or Japan's goods to change? Because, you know, oh, yeah, decades. We think China's cheap. Yeah, China. decades. Oh, yeah. The first Japanese cars were considered crap. They're like Yugos. Yeah, they're just crap. crappy, small Japanese cars, but just really cheap. So it took decades to the point where now Toyota is recognized to be the number one automaker in the world. Even the Germans just copy what, what Toyota does on a daily basis. Toyota is the company in like automotive. They also invest in things like automation and things like that, which is a uh, big plus. So, last slide. Does this imply that we're going to get a U.S. heat sourcing boom soon? High Japanese labor costs, high European labor costs, Chinese costs are increasing. Will production come back to America? Bullying by Trump, you know, will it come back to America? The answer is, well, there's a lot of reasons why it might. You know, Chinese labor inflation, the appreciating currency. Also, on the benefits side, as we've been hearing that U.S. wages haven't increased in 20 years. Well, that sucks if you get wages, but that's good if you're producing in America. Right? Our wages have been stagnant for 20 years, and the Japanese and the Chinese are going up by 10 to 15% a year. So that, that, that's helpful. Robotics and automation, right? That may just make cheap labor irrelevant. Right? That's why China's really worried about this. Right? If robotics really delivers the next decade like everyone thinks it is, labor's irrelevant. So maybe the new world of robotics, you just produce it where your customers are. Because all you try to do is reduce your transportation costs. Build it where you sell it. That might be the new world. And if China never gets a middle class, you have to build it there. Um, on the other hand, um, I, know, I guess that's kind of related to this. There's been more of an emphasis on the supply chain and worry about this. Disruption to production, which maybe help move things back to the U.S. Uh, there's still quality concerns in Asia. I've heard lots of anecdotal suggestions that you know, the Chinese are very good if you set up a facility and produce a widget, but if you ask them to do any kind of modification or anything like that, it, it gets difficult. And I also had someone quote from last year's class: "Is uh, you know we can save a lot of money in China." We can produce it 20% cheaper there than anywhere else in the world. But it's that one time where something goes wrong in their factory, and that one day I have to, hire, I have to rent a 747 to 
to get the production back to the U.S. in time. I've spent the entire savings for two years. And also just lack of intellectual property, uh, lack of environmental safety protection. So all these reasons may help production come back to the U.S., but it's not going to be the production we can make, right? We're not going to make cheap electronics. So what are we going to make? Things that you need to buy robots that are generally high value items that are say really heavy to ship. So cheap electronics, they're not coming back to America. We'll just go to the next time. Vietnam. Whatever that is. Alright, so that's kind of just competitive exposure, kind of looking at more of long term trends and what firms can do. Yeah. I think that could be the model, yeah. Kind of build it where you make it. I mean, things like steel are really tough, but yeah. That's the, yeah. Quality concerns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah. he said it's awful. He doesn't buy it. Yeah. USA, USA. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. So uh, take a little break. We'll do our wrap-up lecture. Get big group hugs and get out of here. So uh, what's uh, ten forty-five? Last lecture is pretty brief. I might get out of here early if that's okay. Is that okay? Just uh, just like a few problems. Hold on. <laughs> Let me just kill the rotation costs. Yes.